Welcome on in, Eagles fans, to a special hot take reaction episode of the No Huddle Show. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always on these episodes by Elliot Shore Parks, Matt Lombardi. You hear them all the time. You read them all, all the time. They cover the Eagles for NJ Advanced Media. They were at Lincoln Financial Field Monday Night Football, Christmas night. And here's the good. The Eagles won 19-10. to 10. They clinched home field advantage throughout the NFC playoffs. They're the number one seed. The road to the Super Bowl goes through Philadelphia. The bad, well, is the way they played, especially offensively. We'll get to a lot of your reaction on Twitter. Uh, Elliot, a couple days out after the game. It's a weird week. They play this week, even though it's nothing to play for. And they have home field. Yet, it, it just feels around the city like the Eagles lost that game on Monday night. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, I know the scoreboard said that they won, but, you know, I put a poll up on Twitter after the game um, asking fans if they felt better or worse after that game. And about 3,500 3, votes in, 84% of people said they felt worse. So, I, you know, it's not often you clinch the number one seed on Christmas night uh, at home, no less, and fans walk away feeling worse. But that's just how bad they were. I mean, they entered that game as basically double-digit favorites. Um, you know, we did the instant reaction pod, and after you watch the game again and you look at it closer, it doesn't look any better. I mean, you know, everyone will say the defense was good, and those five turnovers, they, they were great. But, you know, the Oakland offense is not very good. They have some talent, but this is not a team that's good on offense. So to hold them to the, the 10 points was somewhat impressive. But I just think defense, you know, to me remains a bit of a concern. And we're not even getting into the offense yet, which was just unreal bad. I mean, 37 yards in the second half. Uh, they're basically gifted the game with that Derek Carr interception, which was thrown right at Ronald Darby. So I agree with the fans that came away discouraged. I don't see how you could feel any better after this team um, than you did going into that game. Matt, let me throw this at you. So last week, the offense was good without Carson Wentz in their first game. They put up 34 points on the Giants, although that's not a great defense. Any, any close to it. They still moved the ball. Nick Foles threw four touchdowns. The defense for the Eagles played poorly. This week, it was the opposite. Is that, a, is that better that the defense maybe fixed itself up a little bit, made some plays? Or is this now worse because, um, maybe to make an analogy, there's boats and there's, there's leaks in multiple spots now. The defense one week, the special teams another week offense this week is this better outcome for the Eagles if the defense stepped up and the offense fell back or do you feel worse because now you don't know what they have each week yeah Joe I think it comes down to what do you value more and what do you think is more important to winning in the postseason if you think that the defense is going to be able to stop some of the elite quarterbacks in the NFL and the NFC playoffs like a Matt Ryan like a Drew Brees like a Jared Goff you know the, the playoff caliber opponents that are going to be coming through Lincoln Financial Field if you think that this defense the way they played can get by and not just get by but win the game for you granted they forced three interceptions they had five turnovers and those are all things that are well and good but I think they come playoff time, and we've talked about this before. I think the teams that go to Super Bowls make lengthy playoff runs. They're teams that are complete teams with an offense that complements a defense. This herky-jerky back and forth between the offense carrying you one week, defense carrying you the next, while it's nice and it's one thing to hang your hat on if you're an Eagles fan looking for reasons for optimism. But bigger picture, I'm more concerned about the lack of an offense against a Raiders defense that was pretty much disinterested in being there on Sunday night. And I just look at what happened in Green Bay on, on uh, Christmas Eve when the Packers, you know, they, they've packed it in just as the Raiders have. But Minnesota shut them out on the road 16 to nothing. And that Packers team with Brent Hundley, without Jordy Nelson, without Devontae Adams, they actually had more yards than the Eagles offense did with Nick Foles. So to me, that offense is just so limited when you can't convert on third down. They were one for 14 on third down. When you give up an extra nine minutes of time of possession, to the Oakland Raiders of all teams that have nothing to play for. I really don't know how that translates against a playoff caliber defense, which there are dominant defenses in the NFC playoffs, you know, when you look at Minnesota, when you look at the Rams, and going up against an offense that has the kind of firepower to stay on the field, limit your offensive opportunities. And I just think that this offense is so limited right now that I don't know how you beat some of the defenses that are coming through. It's hard to imagine it. The way Nick Foles, Elliott, played on Monday, you know, I, I tweeted during the game, it's just hard to imagine them winning a playoff game like that. He was awful on Monday night. He did play well and execute the offense against the Giants. So who's the real Nick Foles right now? And, and we know it's not the guy that had 27-2 four years ago. Let's just throw that out. But right now, as the Eagles move forward into the playoffs, what is, like, what is Nick Foles? Because he's had mm -hmm. one good performance, one bad one. 
I feel like if there's a middle ground, they've got a chance to pull out a game maybe in the playoffs and, and, and be competitive. If there's not, if he plays like he did Monday, they're going to be a number one seed that goes home right away. You know, I, so I said after the Giants game and uh, both on the instant react Christian pod and the hot take pod that I didn't think Foles was as good as people other people did against the Giants. I thought he was inaccurate for most of the game against the Giants. And a lot of those touchdowns he had, I mean, he either had an extremely clean pocket to work with, you know, talking like five, six seconds to throw the ball, or the guys were just wide open because of good play calls by Doug Peterson. And against the Giants, it worked, but you saw against even just a slightly better team, still a bad team, but even just not a complete dysfunctional mess like the Giants, you saw what happened. I mean, he's been kind of the same guy the last two weeks. It's just he he looked a little better against the Giants. But when you talk about who Nick Foles is, he's exactly who who I said he was when we first started talking about this Carson Wentz thing. He's a backup quarterback that, you know, is one of the worst, is definitely the worst quarterback in the NFC playoff pitcher. And he's a quarterback that if he's your, if the Eagles were, Eagles team is currently constructed, started week one and had to play 16 game schedule. They're like a six, seven win team. So, you know, Foles is a guy that he doesn't turn it over a ton, even though he's lucky he didn't have two interceptions against the, the Giants. I mean, sorry, against the Raiders. Um, so that is, I guess, one strength is of his, but overall, I mean, it's hard to say really what Foles' strength is. He's not very mobile. You saw that against the Redskins. Um, he's really struggled with accuracy, accuracy issues. And, you know, some of that is he doesn't have a ton of time playing with these guys, but he missed Zach Ertz twice in the end zone just by throwing it too high. And he's played with Ertz before. I mean, Ertz was here when Foles was the quarterback, you know, it feels like centuries ago now. So, there's really not a lot of defense for missing those throws. I mean, it's hard to really say what full strengths are. And it's certainly at that Raiders game, it's a lot easier to say what, what his issues are. And, and one quick thing that I just want to admit that I was a little bit wrong about with this team. And, and Elliot and I have talked about this on the podcast. We've talked about it in the press box at games. You know, I, I didn't think that the Eagles would be a sub 500 team without Carson Wentz. I thought that they'd be good enough in terms of what the defense had been giving them good enough in terms of running the football to, you know, be a competitive team. And, and granted they're, they're two and zero with Nick Foles, albeit against the giants and the Raiders. But what I'm trying to say here is I think Carson Wentz changes everything mm-hmm. about this franchise and about this team. And, you know, we saw exactly why on Monday night it's, it's third downs. The Eagles were the number one, most efficient third down offense in football with Carson Wentz. And that was because of his Houdini like escapability from the pocket. You go back to that Redskin game where he escaped that mass of humanity in the pocket, stepped up, hit Corey Clement for the touchdown on a third down play. We've seen him extend countless drives with his legs or by making money throws into tight windows that Nick Foles showed the other night that he was just good enough to evade the pressure and throw it away and avoid a turnover. That one for 14 on third down, that's a jarring stat. And to me, that shows you a exactly what this Eagles offense is and how limited it is with Foles without Carson Wentz because it affects everything. It affects how long your defense is on the field. It affects your ability to keep the opposing offense off of the field and that's critical come playoff time when you got quarterbacks and running games coming through the link like you're going to have and and I just don't know that it's sustainable to have an offense play that poorly and beat playoff caliber competition. There's two sides to this now. There's, there's the one side of this. I feel like some of the fans, I'll read a couple of the reactions here on Twitter, hashtag the No Huddle Show. Some people say, look, the defense, especially at home, has been great now the entire season. They're 13-2 under Doug Peterson at home. They have home field advantage. Nick just has to not be bad, and they can still get to the Super Bowl. The other side is, well, you know, how can they do that? Like, how could you win like this for the quarterback? Here's a couple, and then, um, then we'll kind of react to this. So, Otto on Twitter said, short of spectacular luck, I don't know how you get anywhere in the playoffs relying on your sometimes their quarterback and your sometimes their defense to be there at the same time for three games in a row on the biggest stages. But Matt, Matthew threw in the other side of this. Brad Johnson, Rex Grossman, Colin Kaepernick, Matt Hasselbeck, I'll even throw Eli Manning. The NFC has proven you don't need an all-time great quarterback to get to the Super Bowl, especially at home. Now, Elliot, before you react to both of those, Mm -hmm. I think it's unfair to put uh, Nick Foles in the same conversation as Brad Johnson, Kaepernick, Hasselbeck, Eli. Those guys they are better. Were, man, yeah, like, <laughs> but they yeah. were accomplished starting quarterbacks. Now, the Rex Grossman one is interesting because he was pretty bad. And 
And that Bears defense and running game carried him. That That's the one maybe I'll entertain. And you can throw Peyton Manning in there with the Broncos when that defense was playing at an all-time level and Manning was essentially a backup quarterback in terms of his skill set at that stage. You but could do that, yep. the element is you had a running game and you had a defense. And I don't know the way the Eagles are playing right now that they have either on that level. Yeah, I mean, that that's my thing too, like – yeah, the Eagles are 10 and 0 or whatever. They've they've won the last 10 at home. That's what you said, right, Joe? They they won the last 10 at the link or they're, they're at least and undefeated. I, yeah, and I think at home. they're you're right. And I think they're 13 and 2 in two seasons under him because they were good at yeah, home but, last year even though they weren't a good team. I, I guess the point I'm making though is you just got to – people have to stop looking at those stats because the team that earned that number one seed, the team that did all these impressive things beginning of the season, that team's gone. That team is no longer the Eagles team that is heading into the playoffs. The Eagles team that we need to talk about is the last two weeks. In the last two weeks, yes, they are 2-0. and And look, they do deserve some credit for winning those games. They just do. But they barely beat a really bad Giants team, and they barely beat a really bad Raiders team. So, you know, yeah, they're undefeated at home, all these things, like blah, blah, blah. None of that matters anymore. The team, the, the Eagles team we talked about for the first 13 weeks of the season is gone. That Carson Wentz was that team. He's no longer playing. With Nick Foles at quarterback, you have to completely reevaluate how you look at this team, what you think they're capable of doing in the playoffs. That's just the reality of the situation. And, yeah, to, to the uh, – Reader's point about the backup quarterbacks and you know those guys that have done well. That is true, but at the same time, that's like four examples. And I mean, how long has NFC been around? You know, so so yeah. I mean, look, the Eagles are going to have a home playoff game. They'll have some modicum of, of a chance in that game just because anytime you play a game, you have a chance. But the reality is, if you just look at the X's and O's, you look at it, you know, just without saying anything can happen. They don't really have a great chance to win a playoff game with Nick Foles as a quarterback. No, they don't. And Vegas has dropped them down way down. I think fourth now in the NFC in terms of chances to win the Super Bowl, which isn't a surprise, Matt. I mean, they don't look right. And I saw you tweeted yesterday your kind of up-to-date uh, NFC power rankings. And yep. they're just – they don't look like and they don't feel like and they don't, they're don't not one of the better teams in the NFC. And like Elliot just said, if Carolina comes in or Atlanta comes in, I, I'd give them a shot to win a game like that against a five I or agree. six seed. But I wouldn't. Just putting you, that out there. You wouldn't there's give not, a shot against either – I, well, I mean, it depends how you define shot. Like, I think they if I think if they played either of those teams, first of all, I would pick those teams to win the game. So, would you both pick those teams to beat the Eagles? See, I'm not know. as sold on Carolina and Cam Newton as, as some people are. People I don't think I picked the them Panthers to beat Atlanta. Earlier in the season, they barely beat the Panthers earlier in the season, and I know that was in Carolina, but they barely won that game with Wentz when they were playing considerably better than they are now. Yeah, you're right. They did. I mean, the only way they win is the defense has to beat what it was in the second half Monday. Matt, how much of that was real and how much it was the Raiders who have – I don't know what happened to that team. Last year they were 12-4. and four. I thought Derek Carr Monday looked awful, and I don't know how much it was just the Eagles defense. He just looked bad. He's regressed this year. Or, or should we buy into this Eagles defense finding itself the way they played in November, or are we not quite sure that's what they are yet? I, I don't think we got a real barometer on Monday night, guys, because here's the thing. The Raiders had nothing to play for. It was Christmas night. You're flying cross country. In the middle of that flight, you get eliminated from the playoffs. And you could just tell by the body language. Freezing outside. When, when they, right, exactly. Freezing cold, 30-mile-an-hour winds. You could tell by those guys' body language on the sidelines. They had no interest in being there. The Patrick Robinson interception came on a really bad underthrow by Derek Carr. He underthrew his receiver, who looked like he might have ran the wrong route based on Carr's reaction uh, on a third down in the first quarter and I, I don't think we really get a barometer for what the Eagles defense is but I do give them credit for stepping up in the second half because I thought that the pass rush applied more pressure on Carr they did get the Ronald Darby interception that led to the game winning field goal so I thought the defense improved in the second half but I think the big picture the double moves that they bid on against the Giants they were an issue again when Amari Cooper um, got Jalen Mills to bite hard on a double move for a 63 yard touchdown and Mills said after the game that listen I'm an aggressive corner sometimes that leads to big plays sometimes that leads to you getting beat but I can't change my aggressiveness Jim Schwartz has talked about why he loves Jalen Mills it's because he's so aggressive those things aren't going to change and when it's Julio Jones or when it's Cooper Cup who the Eagles struggled mightily with against the Rams or if it's Stefan Diggs with his speed with Minnesota that secondary is going to be ripe for the picking when you have top quarterback play and speedy wide receivers that yeah, it's great the Eagles turned it on and they did enough to beat the Raiders. 
but it was the Raiders. And as you said, Joe, that's not the same Derek Carr we've seen in recent years. They had no interest in really being there. So I think that the only time we're going to get a real test of what this Eagles team is and what this defense is, is when you lace them up in the divisional playoffs at home, and you're going to be facing a really good offense regardless of who you face in that game. One, one point I'd like to make about the Jalen Mills thing, and I'm not just defending Mills just because, you know, I've always kind of been higher on him than other people. But Rodney McLeod bit very bad on that double move as well by Amari Cooper. Brian Baldinger does a great job of breaking these plays down on Twitter. And you Hashtag can see, Baldy Breakdowns. That's right. Yep. Yeah, it's one of the best things on Twitter besides my fun. tweets, to be honest. But, <laughs> I mean, like, you, just the video he did of that, you know, obviously Mills gets the, the blame because he's the cornerback. But – then, I mean, if Rodney McLeod doesn't bite, yeah, it's a long catch, but it's a 30-yard catch and not a 63-yard touchdown. So, you know, Mills certainly deserves blame, absolutely. Um, if his ankle wasn't bothering him, I think maybe you play him this week, and we'll, I know we're going to get into what you what we think they should do about that. But Rodney McLeod also bit very badly. So I just think it's something Eagles fans need to realize. With, with everyone calling for Mills to get benched, well, what do you do with McLeod if you're going to bench Mills over it? I mean, McLeod, got, McLeod bit too. Yeah, he did. I mean, and the secondary has given up big plays, even though they played well. I mean, that that's scary in the playoffs because you don't think the Eagles could, you know, make up for that. If they get down or whatever, they're going to have to try to catch up in points. Yeah, he, McLeod's had a lot of issues the last couple weeks. They did get a good pass rush, though. They did get the turnovers. They won the game, obviously the end with the weird play when they score the touchdown. So now they're in. But the question this week, Ellie, and there's there's a lot of questions around this, is what is Doug Peterson going to do? with the starters on Sunday. So before we get into um, kind of the just the machinations of this, because he only has so many guys he could sit, there's only seven spots you could deactivate, what would both of you guys do? So the Eagles didn't look good offensively, yet like they can't lose players because they need it. Whoever they have left, they've lost so many guys. What do you do Sunday versus the Cowboys? It's tough. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I legitimately see both sides because on one hand – I can see why you play them because you're coming off of a terrible offensive performance. Um, there is something to be said for gain, gaining some confidence going into the week, uh, going into the bye week and into the playoff game. Um, their practice schedule this week, they're hardly practicing. I mean, they have a walkthrough two days and a practice on Friday. Um, I'm not sure how much they do on walkthroughs, but it, it's, I mean, it's not a ton. I don't know the specifics of what they'll do this week. Maybe they'll have a more, a more intense walkthrough than normal, but um so that, to me, indicates that he's planning on playing these guys on Sunday. But at the same time, I'm just not sure what 30 snaps against the Cowboys does. I mean, let, let's say Foles goes out there and he throws three touchdowns and they go up 21 nothing. I guess you feel a little better, but I don't know. I mean, I just think the risk of potentially losing Lane Johnson or, or losing a Jason Kelsey to some freak injury, I don't really care about losing Foles, to be honest, at this point. But losing one of those guys could potentially – you know, really, really hurt your chances going into the playoffs. So I'm just not sure. I see the benefit, but I'm not sure if the benefit outweighs the risk. Yeah, I've given this a lot of thought, and I think what you do is – you make Lane Johnson inactive and you start Will Beatty at right tackle. Um, you make Brandon Brooks inactive and you start uh, Isaac Samalu at right guard. And you play Nick Foles for 30 snaps. You play Alshon Jeffrey, Zach Ertz for 30 snaps. Because I don't know that it's about feeling better. I think it's about getting these guys some more in-game action. Let the skill position players develop some sort of a rapport. Because if we saw anything on Monday night, it's that Alshon Jeffrey and Nick Foles aren't on the same page. Jeffrey was targeted only twice, didn't have a catch. Torrey Smith only had one catch for five yards. Nelson Aguilar had four for, I think, 50 yards, four catches. That's just not enough production from the wide receiver position. I'd probably make Wendell Smallwood active and sit LeGarrette Blount because his production has really cratered in December as it did last year with the Patriots. And I would start some of your backups on defense. I'd start Elijah Qualls at tackle, get him some reps. I'd probably start Derek Barnett. I think that you need to get Jalen Mills time to heal. I'd rest him and play Jalen Watkins. I'd sit one of your safeties and play Corey Graham. I would just piecemeal it together. And, and I guess the, the long and short of it is I would play the offensive skill position players about a quarter, maybe a half, no more, get them some time and get as many of my defensive players on ice, let them rest up because especially this late in the year on defense, being healthy and being fresh, I think means so much more than the injury risk 
risk in week 17. And I don't want to put Nick Foles out there for more than a quarter or more than a half on offense because I certainly don't want to face the prospect if I'm the Eagles of Nate Sudfeld being your quarterback in the divisional playoffs. All right, so I have a, I have a lot of opinions on all that. <laughs> so all let's right. hear. Before you, Elliot, right. before you go into them, just to give a little uh, context, I just saw the line. Vegas has the Cowboys as two and a half point favorites on Sunday, so they're not. Mm. And I know the Eagles haven't played well, but the Eagles, they're not buying that the Eagles starters are going to play much because the Eagles obviously, or, would be or they are, <laughs> or or they just think the Eagles are so bad now. But yeah, most I mean, likely they don't buy that Doug's going to play full as much in this game. So so my first thing I would say is. I, I agree that on defense, I'm less concerned about who plays and who doesn't, um, just because I think the defense is fine at this point, to a certain degree at least. I don't think there's any benefit to playing the defense. Um, Jalen Mills, Ronald Darby, these guys aren't going to all of a sudden stop jumping on double moves because they play 20 snaps against the Cowboys. So I do think on defense you can be far more liberal with, with who you sit. But my only issue, Matt, with what you said is – like, if you're going to put Foles out there, I think you have to put everybody out there with them because the whole benefit of playing Foles is to get the first-team offense some snaps together, is to give him a chance to succeed. And if you sit Lane and you sit, you know, uh, Brandon Brooks and guys like that, it's just – I mean – it's you know, put Will Beatty out there. Foles could could be on the same page with the receivers. He might be running for his life the whole game. And it, to me, it's not so much about the possibility of getting Foles hurt because honestly, at this point, I'm not so sure my opinion on their chance of winning would change much with Sudfeld as it would Foles at this point because the quarterback play they're getting is so bad that I don't think it makes much of a difference. At least with Sudfeld, maybe there's a you know one in a million shot he comes in and somehow surprises. I think with Foles, you know exactly what you're going to get. Um, I'm not saying I would start Sudfeld. I'm just saying my concern is not about Foles getting hurt. But if you're going to put Foles out there, I think you have to put the first-team offense out there with him in its entirety. And that's tough. And I'll I'll go over this with you guys, see what you think. I mean, they only have three backup offensive linemen, really. They have they have Sale Malu, Wiz, and Beatty. But you're probably not – you're not starting Wiz. I mean, sorry, you're probably not playing Wiz this Sunday. So – I don't know what you do along the offensive line. I think you have to address all of them. You definitely have to address all of them, actually, I guess besides Wiz, because they're probably going to do that for health reasons. But what do you do with your backup offensive line? I mean, do you keep Kelsey in all game? Do you put Sam Malu at center? And if you put Sam Malu at center, who are you putting in at guard? So the fact that this team's only carried eight guys at offensive line, to me, is going to be an issue this Sunday in terms of putting their line together. It's funny, yeah, we, you I don't, know, it's I don't one disagree. of those things you never talk about, Matt, uh, with the offensive line unless you have injuries. This is the time you need them. When it's week 17, you have something locked up, you know, you want to rest guys. They don't, like Elliot was just uh, kind of laying out there, they don't have that many backups. No, you're right, and, and it does limit what you're able to do. I just look at, and again, I don't mean to sound like you value players other than others more than others, but if but you do, Lane I mean, John, but if yeah, but if Lane, if Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks get hurt in a meaningless game, I, I think that that to me is a doomsday scenario. For, See, but I I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. But what I'm saying is. By playing Foles, you're admitting the game isn't meaningless. I understand it is meaningless. I get that. But by playing Foles and Alshon Jeffrey and those guys, you're saying that the game has some meaning. And it's just hard for me to put Foles out there. Because, look, I agree with you. They lose Lane Johnson. Lane Johnson's the number one player they can't afford to lose at this point. I completely agree with you. But the reality is at this point, I guess you just have to value – if you're going to value getting them on a roll and getting some success before the playoffs, then you're valuing that over health, and you just have to take that risk. So in every other Week 17 scenario, I agree with you. I wouldn't even lay, let Lane Johnson enter the building. Like, Just tell him to stay at home and make sure he's healthy. But if you're going to put Foles out there, I just think you have to give him the best chance to succeed. And if that means risking Lane, that's just where you are at this point of the season. Yeah, I think if that if that's the argument and if you're going to say that you have to play your offensive line in order to play Foles, then I think you sit them. And, and I, I understand yeah, the argument fine. of I wanting just, to yeah, get these yeah. guys on the same page. But I think that, you know, you can piecemeal together a line to get him through a quarter or get him through a half. But if you're not comfortable with that prospect of Will Beatty or, say, Amalu playing, then I think that you have to value health over getting sharp. All right, guys, let's wrap Let's wrap with this this week. I mean, and this will be a conversation I'm sure we'll have for the next couple of weeks. But just quick thoughts to, to wrap up this week's episode, Elliot. How much of the next three weeks? So it's almost three full weeks till we'll kick off the playoff game against whoever, New Orleans or Carolina or Atlanta, whoever it's going to be. 
is on Doug Peterson to you know concoct and craft some sort of different offense or different game plan for that game around Nick Foles. I mean, do you think Doug is going to drastically change things? Do you think they're just going to go into that game and hope Nick can get the job done? And it feels like there's a lot of time, but also not much time to, to create something that will work for let's just take it one game at a time, that divisional round game. How much do you think is on Doug here to try to figure something out to, I don't know, mm-hmm. hide Nick or get him through a game? Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely on Doug. I mean, the pressure is completely on him. Um, as I mentioned, against the Giants, Foles looked as good as he did because of the play calls and the situations Doug set him up in and the fact that the Giants are terrible. But, I mean, that there that was part of it. But I'm not so sure what what Doug can do. I mean, you know, Foles was having trouble, ca- you know, just simply catching the snap on, on, on Christmas night. He was overthrowing guys that were open. I mean, you can design the best offense in the world, but unless that offense is just going to be Foles handing it off or just doing dump screens, you know, I'm not so sure how, how much Doug can do. So I agree with you. Like, this is a huge pressure situation for Doug. And I will say, like, before they played the Giants, whenever Doug would talk, I would sense, like, a sense of excitement and optimism in, in a in a way that he felt this was a chance for, for him to really, like, rally the troops and do that. Not by any means that he was happy Carson got hurt. I'm just saying I think he really embraced the challenge. Haven't really sensed that so much <laughs> over the past few times Doug's talk. I think maybe the reality of the situation is starting to set in a little bit, and he knows it's a huge task ahead of him. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm not ripping Doug by saying I don't think he's up to the challenge. I don't think anybody could could win the Super Bowl with this roster. Well, well, I mean, we'll see what happens. But I think, and Elliot and I talked about this after the game on the postgame podcast, I really think that Doug Peterson and Frank Reich and, and almost foolishly went into the Giants game and went into the Raiders game thinking that they could run their offense with Nick Foles. And I think that what we saw on Monday night is – you're going to have to adapt this offense. It's going to have to change. Um, And I think that one of the things that you need to do is you need to commit to running the football. And you look at what happened on Monday night. In the first quarter, they ran for 48 yards. In the first half, they had a total of 60 rushing yards. By the end of the game, they only had 78 rushing yards in what turned out to be a one-score game. And and that touchdown at the end is just kind of garbage time and extended the lead. But in the competitive portion of the game, it was 13 to 10. So there's really no reason to get away from the running game. And I think that if you're Doug Peterson and you're Frank Reich and you're John Filippo, you need to spend these next two weeks sitting down in the film room with, with Nick Foles, going out on the practice field with Nick Foles and figuring out, okay, what are the routes that you're most comfortable with? What are the throws that you feel most confident in making? And we're going to craft an offense around those throws, but committing to run the ball ball 50 55 60 percent of the times use the run to set up the pass similarly to what the Rams do with Todd Gurley and I think that's the only way you have a shot at this thing because we saw on Monday night and even though we threw four touchdowns against the Giants uh, some of those inaccuracy issues some of those underthrows some of those overthrows could be a byproduct of those routes certainly were routes and concepts that Carson Wentz was comfortable with and it had succeeded with and this offense put up some great numbers with but you're not going to be able to do that with Nick Foles and his skill set. So I think that it is omnipotent that they go out over these next three weeks and put together an offense that's crafted specifically around Nick Foles, or you're pretty much going to be one and done. Incredible turn of events. Eagles are 13 and two. They have home field and yet we have no idea what they're going to be and how they're going to look when they get there. Elliot, as always, thanks for doing this. And we'll talk soon as we get ready for a playoff game. Yep. Talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Matt. Thanks guys. Have a great one. You too. Thanks to all of you for listening. Remember to subscribe, iTunes, and leave us a rating there. Helps the show grow as we head into the Eagles playoff run right here for NJ.com.